Jenny Stiletovich was out kayaking in the winding waterways of Florida's Lower Keys when she noticed something unusual, a small tooth sawfish thrashing around in the mangroves as if it were battling an unseen force in January 2024. Then five days later, it was gone. Jenny wasn't the only one noticing this. Since November, these usually peaceful creatures have been seen twitching, spinning around, and then sinking down to the seafloor without a trace. What was going on? So what's going on with all these sea creatures dying? Let's get started. Florida's waters have always been a place for strange and fascinating creatures, but in early 2024, there was something really unsettling going on beneath the surface. It all began with reports of small tooth sawfish, these huge ancient looking creatures, thrashing around before diving down, never to come back up. By July, more than 100 of these endangered giants were spotted thrashing around, and at least 54 were confirmed dead. And that was just the ones that people noticed. Since sawfish sink when they die, the actual death toll was probably a lot higher. This really couldn't have come at a worse time, could it? There are only about 450 breeding females of the small tooth sawfish left in the whole ocean, which is pretty alarming since they were already on the brink. After years of habitat destruction and fishing mishaps, they found themselves on the brink, becoming the very first fish species to receive protection under the U.S. Endangered Species Act. It seemed like conservation efforts were finally making a difference. But then this mysterious die-off popped up and threatened to undo all that hard work. It wasn't only sawfish, you know. By autumn 2023, divers and fishermen in the Keys were noticing a bunch of species, snapper, snook, grouper, moving in this strange, almost mindless way before they just sank to the bottom. It felt like there was this weird underwater plague going around. The crisis wasn't only an ecological disaster, it was also affecting people's wallets. With panic on the rise, health officials are advising Floridians to steer clear of eating fish caught in the waters that have been impacted. Fishing guides noticed that many of their bookings were canceled because tourists were feeling anxious and decided to stay away, worried about getting sick. Things were getting out of hand and no one really knew what was behind it all. By April 2024, scientists were really fed up. They kicked off an emergency effort to track, study, and if they can, rescue the sawfish that are affected. Hey everyone, if you spot anything interesting, be sure to give a shout to the wildlife hotline. When a struggling sawfish was spotted, teams quickly hopped on boats, eager to catch and study it before time ran out. They would collect blood samples, tag the fish, and keep an eye on its condition, all in the hopes of understanding what was happening. On April 5th, they thought they had a breakthrough. Hey, guess what? An 11-foot sawfish was seen just hanging out in Cudjo Bay, hardly moving at all. Rescuers took it over to the Moat Marine Laboratory in Sarasota, and the specialists there put in some serious hours to try and save it. There was a glimmer of hope for a moment. The fish seemed to get a little better with regular care. After 20 days, things took a turn for the worse, and it sadly passed away. It was such a tough loss, really heartbreaking. This was new ground for us. Scientists had never documented a mass mortality event of an endangered species quite like this before. Things got really urgent, and in July, Florida decided to put $2 million towards research. The pressure was building up. Scientists were in a rush to find answers, and one ecologist, Ross Busek, really nailed the situation when he said, it's like a final exam you forgot about, and you've got two hours to learn everything. Teams are out on the water gathering samples from all over the keys, water, seaweed, fish tissues, looking for anything that might shed light on the crisis. They took a look at the oxygen levels, pH, temperature, pollutants, bacteria, and toxins. After months of digging deep into their research, they ended up with nothing, no clear evidence, there's no clear explanation here. But that doesn't mean they didn't find anything. One big suspect really caught my attention. Red Tide, this toxic algae bloom, which happens naturally, has been causing havoc for marine life for centuries. There are more than 300 species of Red Tide algae out there, and interestingly, they can change the water to green, orange, or even a deep blood red, despite what their name suggests. And guess what? One of the most dangerous types, Karenia brevis, is actually doing really well in the Gulf of Mexico, just off the Florida Keys. This small yet deadly organism produces brevitoxin, a potent neurotoxin that targets nerve cells. At elevated levels, it can lead to confusion, 
paralysis, and, in the end, fatality. Does this ring a bell? The sawfish weren't merely spinning aimlessly. They were probably poisoned, their nervous systems devastated by toxic algae blooms. Red tide has existed for centuries. Ancient indigenous records reference it, but in recent times, it has intensified significantly. Rising temperatures, driven by climate change, set the stage for explosive growth of massive blooms. Human activity is exacerbating the situation. Farms release runoff brimming with fertilizers, flowing into rivers and ultimately the ocean, providing algae with an endless feast. This sets off a domino effect. Oxygen levels plummet, CO2 levels surge, ocean acidification intensifies, creating even greater challenges for marine species that are already fighting for survival. Was red tide the culprit? Perhaps. However, this was not the sole theory circulating. As researchers delved further, increasingly unsettling possibilities started to surface. In the United States, approximately 65% of waterways have suffered damage from nutrient pollution, a phenomenon that triggers rampant algae growth and threatens the survival of entire ecosystems. Florida's manatees have already become victims. In 2021, more than 1,000 of these gentle giants tragically perished due to starvation. As fertilizer runoff and sewage leaks led to dense algae blooms that obstructed sunlight, ultimately decimating their primary food source, seagrass. By 2023, the situation had deteriorated significantly. A shocking 77,000 acres of seagrass have vanished, resulting in more manatees fighting for their survival. However, this phenomenon wasn't limited to Florida alone. In 2024, hikers in Korotutahi, New Zealand, encountered a shocking sight. 3,500 lifeless eels strewn across the banks of a nearly desiccated stream. The juvenile eels, known as elvers, depend on cool, consistent water flow for their upstream migration. However, they encountered water that was instead filled with algae and overheated. The stream had nearly come to a standstill. Oxygen levels dropped sharply and toxins accumulated, leaving the eels with no chance of survival. The effects of climate change were unfolding before our eyes. What's the deal with the sawfish? Is it possible that algae caused them to spin uncontrollably before meeting their demise? Researchers believe this to be true, and historical evidence appeared to support their claims. In 2010, a remarkable discovery unfolded in Chile's Atacama Desert, where paleontologists unearthed an ancient mass grave teeming with prehistoric marine life. Cherubalina, translating to Whale Hill, boasts the most concentrated assemblage of extinct marine mammals ever discovered. Among the fossils were the remains of more than 40 colossal baleen whales, strange bear-sized aquatic sloths, and a haunting hybrid of a walrus and a whale featuring enormous tusks. However, the most captivating aspect, certain skeletons exhibited unusual orange patches, probably the remnants of toxic algae. Researchers suggest that these prehistoric beings fell victim to toxic algal blooms, either through consuming tainted prey or breathing in lethal toxins. Throughout millennia, this devastating event has occurred not just once, but on four distinct occasions. Dr. Michael Parsons of Florida Gulf Coast University had a hunch that the sawfish might be experiencing a similar situation. In a compelling demonstration of his theory, scientists observed that certain fish began to show signs of recovery when introduced to clean water. Remarkably, as the tides changed, certain fish returned to their typical behavior in as little as 25 minutes. Here's another important hint. Fish sourced from deeper waters, areas known for elevated toxin levels, also appeared to show improvement. Sawfish, as creatures that dwell on the ocean floor, would have faced heightened vulnerability. That's it then? Case closed? It turns out it was algae all along? Actually, that's not quite right. Researchers conducted tests on the water and found no unusually high levels of Karenia brevis, the infamous red tide algae prevalent in the Gulf of Mexico. However, they discovered something unexpected. Remarkably high levels of an algae known as Gambier discus. Typically benign, this algae can become deadly in excessive quantities. In a typical sample of Florida Keys seawater, you can expect to find approximately 30 to 40 Gambier discus cells per pint. Are the samples collected in 2024? 
more than 1,000 cells. That's an incredible leap. Certain species of Gambier discus generate ciguatoxins, a powerful neurotoxin that accumulates in coral reef fish. Consuming contaminated seafood can lead to ciguatera poisoning, an unpleasant condition characterized by symptoms such as vomiting, diarrhea, and neurological disturbances, including tingling sensations and hallucinations. Unlike other creatures, fish do not experience vomiting. Instead, their nervous systems become unhinged, leading to twitching and erratic movements. Indeed, that astonishing death spiral observed in sawfish. The theory gains further credibility as ciguatera outbreaks frequently surge in compromised reef systems, where stress catalyzes heightened toxin production. In the tumult of World War II, bombs devastated reefs throughout the Pacific, resulting in widespread incidents of ciguatera poisoning. Florida may not have been facing bombs, but it certainly grappled with unprecedented heat levels. During the summer of 2023, temperatures climbed to almost 100 degrees Fahrenheit, driving ocean conditions to their limits. Was Ciguatera the definitive culprit? Not exactly. There was a single issue. If this toxin had infiltrated the food chain, individuals would undoubtedly be falling ill from consuming contaminated fish. However, that was not the case. Lab tests uncovered an even more alarming finding. The water was tainted with a cocktail of toxins from multiple algae species. A lethal blend of poisons was at play, each one interacting in complex ways that scientists had yet to fully unravel. Ultimately, despite extensive research and rigorous testing, no one could definitively pinpoint the cause of the sawfish die-off. The enigma lingered, a conundrum with an abundance of elusive fragments. As of July 2024, the alarming trend of mass die-offs in the ocean appears to have diminished, yet the uncertainty looms. Will that unsettling illness return to haunt us once more? It's evident that much of the responsibility lies with us. Increasing ocean temperatures have accelerated the proliferation of toxic algae, rendering the waters more perilous for marine life. The sawfish catastrophe is merely a fragment of a far larger issue. Across the globe, marine life is grappling with one crisis after another, with human actions frequently at the heart of the matter. Consider whales, for instance. These remarkable sentient beings have faced unprecedented challenges in recent years. In 2022, an astonishing event unfolded as 230 pilot whales inexplicably beached themselves along the shores of Macquarie Harbor in Tasmania, Australia. While some were successfully rescued, the majority sadly did not survive. Local farmers were compelled to venture out to sea, where scavengers took care of the rest. This was just one of many occurrences. Since 2017, more than 500 minke and humpback whales have been discovered stranded, injured, or deceased along the east coast of North America. What's behind this? Critics have raised concerns about offshore wind farms, alleging that the intense seismic surveys employed to chart the ocean floor disturb whales causing them to become agitated. However, scientists have largely rejected this theory. The Bureau of Ocean Energy Management discovered that these surveys generate sound levels of approximately 220 decibels, certainly loud, yet significantly quieter than the 250 decibel explosions employed in oil and gas exploration. If disturbed, whales would likely simply swim away. Who are the true offenders? A blend of maritime activity, commercial fishing, and environmental contamination. The impact of plastic has been nothing short of catastrophic. In 2018, a sperm whale was found stranded on an Indonesian beach, its stomach containing more than 13 pounds of plastic, comprising 115 plastic cups, 25 bags, two flip-flops, and over 1,000 pieces of string. Picture the weight of that lingering in your stomach, and that's merely one whale. Between 2016 and 2023, only 50% of the whales that stranded along the East Coast were able to be examined, highlighting the magnitude of the issue. Among those examined, 40% had experienced collisions with ships or entanglement in fishing gear. The issue at hand cannot be attributed to a single factor. Rather, it encompasses a multitude of elements. While you might feel sympathy for whales, dolphins are facing their own set of challenges. Increasing ocean temperatures do more than trigger algae blooms. They also facilitate the spread of deadly diseases. From 2013 to 2015, 
Approximately 1,600 dolphin carcasses were found along East Coast beaches, stretching from Florida all the way to New York. However, that was merely a glimpse of the true impact. Experts estimate that approximately 20,000 dolphins perished, resulting in the loss of half the population in that area. What was causing their demise? A ruthless virus known as cetacean morbillivirus, essentially the dolphin equivalent of measles. With the ocean's temperature rising, the virus flourished, spreading its reach to dolphins along the coastline. It assaulted their lungs and brains, leaving their bodies marred with sores. What's the most frustrating aspect? Dolphins, known for their social nature, were inadvertently transmitting it among themselves. As they burst from the water in unison, they release virus particles into the air, which are then inhaled by healthy dolphins. Contact can lead to the spread of infection via open wounds. Even unborn calves face danger, as ill mothers could transmit the illness to them prior to birth. What do you think? Let me know in the comments.